Hello and welcome to Taking You to School with Dr. Tom Pritchard. I'm your host, JP. I jump off with a two man power trip of wrestling. Of course, joining me, the star of the show, the former WWE World Tag Team Champion, one of the greatest trainers ever in history of the business, the doctor of desire himself, Dr. Tom Pritchard. How are you doing today, sir? John, I'm doing great. I hope you're doing great too. Doing good. What's going on in the world of JPWA? Uh, we're getting ready for a graduation coming up next week, and uh, everybody did promos tonight. Well, we, we couldn't do promos tonight, so we watched some promos. We watched some good promos and some bad promos. We watched the rock concert from SmackDown, then we watched Cody Rhodes from uh, Raw this week to uh, give them an idea how to uh, tell a story. So everybody's doing good. Did you like the rock promo in his concert? I did, and it, it kind of brought me back to the Attitude Era, and uh, I didn't think we were allowed to do that anymore. But uh, but it's The Rock, so and even Cody's promo on Raw was very Attitude Era esque. I think yes, yes, that was good. So, I didn't know if Cody could hang with him, but he was you know not that he's with him, but he I didn't know if he could come back and have a good comeback. But he was great. I thought he, I thought he did very well. Yeah, I really did. I didn't know Michelle had. Uh, Jumped across uh, some seats to at a Willie Nelson concert, beat up an undercover cop. That's that was interesting. <laughs> although, yeah. although it doesn't it doesn't surprise me, it doesn't shock me at all. But I didn't know that. I guess Cody, a bit of a mama's boy. I guess it seems like. Well, yeah, but that's okay. Rock's oh, a mama's yeah. boy. Yeah. Oh, big time. Yeah. Sure. So that's all right. The modern day cowboy himself, Mitch Miller. Good evening. Good evening, Mitch. Jason, hello, Dr. Thomas or John. Hope you're both having a great week. I'm having a great week. Ibsen, hello, Ibsen. Ibsen! It's interesting with the, the Rock and Cody. What do you think? Do you think that Rock could fight Roman like after WrestleMania? I mean, Rock versus Roman, or is it Rock Cody? Because it seems like Rock and Cody have a lot going for them as far as building something. I, I could see Rock and Cody. I sure could. Um, after WrestleMania, depending on what happens. So I've, I've read both sides. Uh, Cody's going to finish the story, and then I read uh, Cody's not going to finish the story. So who knows? I like the people. I like the way uh, they keep everybody guessing. When you look at Cody not finishing a story, where would he go from there? That would be kind of crazy if he didn't win. Well, it would be kind of crazy, but uh, maybe he's got somebody else to veer off with, branch off with. I don't know. Maybe it's a rock. That would be interesting. I'm hearing that he may have a movie to film coming up. As far yeah. As the... Right before SummerSlam, right? Yep. Yeah, so maybe that would be uh, pushing it. But I, I still think uh, I'd like to see Cody finish the story. I think that'd be the cool thing. But at the same time, that that's what everybody's thinking. So they might just pull a swerve. You never know. You might go to the ring with two finishes and say, listen, the crowd's doing this, do that. And if the crowd's doing that, do this. Now, business has been really good. Would it be risky to take the title off Roman now just because of how great business is? Yeah, I think it would be risky. But at the same time, you know, uh, Cody's been chasing this, this dream since last year. And, you know, eventually it's got to pay off one way or another. Because if he can't get it, then what's the, what's the sense of doing all this stuff? This way, Bar I think. Barbara, so good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Sorry I'm late. Well, Barbara, we got to work on your tardiness. <laughs> so uh, last week, Dark Side of the Ring had Buff Bagwell on, and Scorch is going to make an interesting point here. In July of 2001, Buff Bagwell's mother, Judy, called the WBF's office to request that her son get time off the heel from an injury. She also complained about his travel arrangements. What are your thoughts? Well, if that is indeed true, and I've heard both sides that uh, she did call and I heard that she didn't, you know, so, I mean, whatever side you believe, uh, I think that if, if you have an injury, you should be the one calling, not your mom. And uh, and also, if you have something to say about your travel arrangements, you should be, be taking care of that, too. So my thoughts are Buff should, uh, should do it by himself and not, not with his mom calling. I had once asked Buff about it, and he was saying that, oh, Jim Ross is full of shit. And right. the next day, we ran into Jim Ross. So I said, oh, Buff, here, here we go. 
perfect opportunity. You were literally just telling me yesterday that Jim Ross is full of shit. He goes up to Jerry. Goes, hey, doing Jr. How's it, how's it going? Doesn't say a word about right. it. <laughs> yeah, sounds about right. So was Buff making it up, and his mom really did do that? I can't see Jim uh, Ross making that up. I can't see Jr. making that up either. But uh, you know, I've heard both sides. So uh, yeah, if, if if that's the case, I. Th- I I think that uh, you shouldn't have your mother call, especially your own your company like WWF, WWE at that time. Speaking of Mama's Boy, he was a big Mama's Boy uh, for Judy Bagwell. Sure. Judy Bagwell on a pole. Yes. Great, yeah. great match. It's actually Judy Bagwell on a forklift match. On a remember? forklift. Yeah, okay, that's... she wasn't on a pole. Yeah. That'd be a different uh, occupation, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Judy Bagwell on the pole. Canyon and had to, on the main stage, Judy Bagwell. Yep. Yes. Canyon had to put her on there. Yeah. Remember he had the, the painted shirt of Judy Bagwell too? I'm trying to forget stuff like that. Crazy. Yeah. Craig said Buff would have his mother call Bad News Allen would not. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. Bad News Allen wouldn't have his mom do anything for him. <laughs> I, I, I highly doubt it. Yeah, uh, Barbara is making a great point here, and I definitely agree. It seems like the fans are behind the Rock now. Have you noticed that? Well, I, I noticed that with the Memphis fans anyway, because the Rock came out as a baby face and then he he turned heel. But uh, I mean, he put over Memphis like a like a champ. So I can see why the fans in Memphis would get behind him. Are you starting to see maybe some regrets of some of these fans that were the, you know, the Cody cry babies that were saying we want Cody. Cause I'm seeing rock getting cheered a lot. And when Roman cut rock off and said, you need to acknowledge me. And he did the crowd was like crazy for that too. So it's like, damn, we could have had that match. All they needed to do was see that. And now that everybody wants that match. Every, everybody is so fickle these days. You know, you, you, you think that uh, you can change it and they did, they changed it. They changed yep. the main event. So yep. Uh, the, the seeds were planted, and then all of a sudden, come to find out, uh, I guess they stuck their finger in the air and said, oh, wait a minute, the wind's blowing this way, so let's go here. But maybe they are regretting a little bit of that, you know, because it's, uh, like I said, if Cody doesn't finish the story, then we're, we're you're right, where does he go? Maybe it's with uh, uh, Seth, maybe it's with Rock, maybe... Who knows? But if Rock has a movie coming out, he's not going to be available too much longer. Very true. The modern day cowboy Mitch Miller is saying I've always smelled what The Rock was cooking since day one ish. I agree. I do agree. Uh, team Boots to Asses, LOL. Yes, Boots to Asses. Remember that great catchphrase he had? Yeah. And well, you've been Team Rock since day one because um, you basically trained him and honed his skills and brought him to prominence in the WWF, getting him ready for Survivor Series 96. This is true, John. So you, you've been uh, with The Rock since day one-ish. I've been, smelling, I've been smelling what he's cooking, too, since day one. Ibsen's good question here. Off topic. Thoughts on the U.S. Express, a.k.a. Mike Rotundo and Barry Windham going into the Hall of Fame and the entire class as well? I I think that's a great uh, addition to the Hall of Fame. I think Mike Rotundo and Barry Windham uh, certainly deserve their spots. Uh, somebody I, I was surprised to hear about was Thunderbolt Patterson, but at the same time, due to everything that Thunderbolt's been through in the business and done in the business, I, I mean, it makes sense that he would go in the Hall of Fame. Um, Muhammad Ali belongs in there. I think everybody belongs in there who's going in there this this time. So uh, Paul Heyman, especially in Philadelphia, oh, my God. It's just going to be awesome. It is crazy that Thunderbolt Patterson got in like out of nowhere because he was never in WWF and kind of forgotten. But really, Dusty kind of stole a bit of his spiel from Thunderbolt, or at least inspired by Thunderbolt. So he, his footprints are, are everywhere. That's what I mean. Thunderbolt inspired a lot of people. And he did uh, – uh, I, I bring him up a lot when, when people forget words in a promo because T-Bolt would always say, I'm full. And, oh, if I just had enough time. And, oh, I, sometimes if I, if I just said what I wanted to say. And then he would give him time to think. And he was uh, – he was good at stalling when he forgot. 
So, uh, but you know, he, he, his career was mainly in the South and, uh, Bob Armstrong, I don't think ever worked for WWF or WWE, uh, at all either. He's in the hall of fame. So, um, I mean, whether we want to admit it or not, I think WWE is the one everybody looks to at the hall as the hall of fame in wrestling. So, yep. uh, it, it's a, it's a great thing to be in it. From Dell Mountain, Dr. Tom, I believe Shane Helms' version of the story on the Buff Bagwell fight. I think Bagwell initiated or Buff initiated it and instigated it. Um, and he got what he deserved. Do you agree with this? Do you think the buff version is not the actual version of the story? I would I would be more inclined to believe Shane than I would Buff. And, and I like Buff. I mean, uh, he's always been cool to me. I've never had any problem with him. But at the same time, I know, <laughs> I know people like Buff. And I've been around people like Buff before. So I know how the story can kind of change and, and – uh, be, um, I don't want to say fabricated, but uh, uh, embellished a little bit with his own colors and, and put his crayons on to, to the story. On the Dark Side of the Ring episode, I'm like listening to the story because I've heard it from a few wrestlers and I'm just listening to it and Buff says his version of it. I was like, wait, what the hell is he talking about? That's not what I've heard like through, through the years. So it was weird to hear that version. You didn't really get the, the Shane Helms version. What, but, what was what was Buff's version? So basically, um, when he he said that Shane was busting his balls about getting too much ring time, and when he turned his back, Shane put a like a frozen water bottle to the back of his head. Now I had I had never heard that one before, so I was just like, "Wow, that that was weird. Where did, where did that come from?" And Shane, of course, on Twitter the next day was saying, "Not true. That's bullshit." X all the wrestlers like this is completely made up. So I was just surprised that that was the story that uh, Buff had come up with. Yeah, well, some people have foggy memories, you know, and uh, that happens. Well, the story that I heard from a couple of wrestlers was that Buff kind of initiated it or really instigated it a, a little bit and kind of teasing him, and they got into a scuffle, and, and Shane more or less won, but Buff was saying he got cheap-shotted. So I think that maybe that was his kind of way out of why he lost, maybe. Yeah, it could be. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen the Bagwell episode, but, uh, you know, I've, I've heard it's an interesting episode. I might have to check that out. Very interesting. He, I mean, I love Buff. He's great, but he he's a storyteller. In a good way and, and sometimes in a bad way. I think we all are. Yes. Oh, yes. Please ask Dr. Tom if he knew The Rock was going to be such a huge star when he trained him. I think. Well, well uh, when when you looked at him, you knew he was going to be a top guy, but I don't think anybody, including well, maybe Rock felt it, but I don't know if anybody really felt he was going to be this mega superstar, movie star, international star, globally recognized um to the capacity that he is so you knew he's going to be big i i just i don't think anybody could have told back then how big but you got to remember when he started out he's rocky my via with that chia pet haircut <laughs> yeah too. and yeah. even the name rocky my via is kind of corny he's got to be his own thing it can't be a combination of his dad and his grandfather right ragu in hindsight it was wrong for WB to release Buff over one bad match that had to be political. He was being hazed backstage as well. I don't know if that's the case. I think, uh, I don't know if it was just because of one bad match, but, you know, just like the question earlier about his mom calling the office and little things like that. You know, it's, it's, um, life is political. And in any company you, you go to, there's going to be politics. So, um, whether it was or wasn't, I think it was a matter of the other outside forces that were entering in to Buff's career in WWE from his mom calling the office, talking to JR and, and wanting special privileges and things like that. Um, I think there were a lot of other elements at, at play there. When you think about it too. He's gone after that, the, the Judy Bagwell calling and, and yeah. t t with JR. Then Vince gets pissed you know, about all that. 
the rumor is he told JBL when they all beat up the WCW guys and they beat up Buff. And remember, they throw him out of the ring and they threw him out of the building, all that other stuff. There is a vicious clothesline by JBL. And they're saying, oh, Vince ordered JBL to do that. I, I don't know if necessarily it's true, but it seems like JBL was just stiff with everybody. I mean, nothing yeah. like, nothing for Buff, but people claim that that big clothesline was, was extra stiff. Well, you can read anything you want when you have a conspiracy theory, you know, and, and yeah, JBL was, was just solid with everybody. So, yeah, he didn't, he didn't pull any punches. Do you think Vince would tell somebody, hey, go hurt this guy or no? Well, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities, but I don't, I don't personally think that, that he would unless there was just some magnitude re, uh, of incidents or uh, reasons to do it. And I, I, I just don't think so. I think that'd be very unprofessional if, in fact, that did happen, but I don't think it did. Can you believe that he got released that quickly? I mean, that's kind of crazy. I mean, basically one match he's gone. Two matches, really. Yeah, and uh, what was it? Uh, Jerry Jarrett, who had an interview with him, uh, talking about the problems he had, and you know, and it, do you remember that when Jerry Jarrett was talking to Buff and uh, by the ring and, and talking about all his issues and, and these problems he had? So I, I think that no matter what, um, Buff had a overinflated opinion of himself and when you come to wwe you know you had to earn respect and uh i I don't know that buff understood that he was in a different world and uh you know it it takes a little bit to get used to shane c i'm glad buff getting over his addiction yeah me too i i hope he's uh, getting over and getting past it obviously he's down there with ddp and DDP is uh, infamous for helping these wrestlers, Jake the Snake, Scott Hall, now Scotty Riggs as well. So uh, Butterbean, to th- throw his name in the hat. So yeah. DDP, he's a godsend for sure. Well, good for, for DDP and good for Buff. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad Buff's getting over his addiction too. I'm glad, I'm glad there's a place uh, to go, like going to DDP's. Magazine says, at the time WCW got acquired by WWF, I suspected a lot of the WCW wrestlers wouldn't adapt well to WWF's culture. Sadly, I was right, and Bagwell was among the first to be released. Did you agree with that? Yeah, because WWF's culture back then was was certainly a uh, high-maintenance culture, and and you had to earn the, the respect of everybody uh, on the roster. So I, I can I can certainly agree with that because WCW wasn't run the same way, and uh, different personalities, different circumstances. So yeah, I, I certainly do agree that um, it's it was it would be hard to adapt, and even guys who had been there for a while, you know, I I remember coming in and I knew I knew a lot of people who were already there. But you still have to adapt and you still have to uh, understand what's going on. And if you don't understand what's going on, uh, you're going to get lost in the shuffle. Do you think that some of the WF guys thought uh, lesser than because they, they beat WCW and WCW was bought by WWF? Is that a problem too? Well, I can, I can see that way of thinking also. But, you know, Booker T made it okay. Um, oh, yeah. You know, who are the other guys that came from WCW who did okay? Mysterio. Uh, yeah. You know, so there were some, yeah, there were some guys who, who did just fine. But they understood how to how to play the game and how to get what they needed to get. Nobody is more deserving of the WWE Hall of Fame than Dr. Tom. It's a travesty. There is no justice. Well, I don't know if nobody's just more deserving, but thank you, Barbara. Do wrestlers exaggerate their stories or embellish the truth? Once or twice, I think there's been a few. Maybe. Maybe they exaggerate or embellish. They. Not Not me. I was was going to say, I I certainly never embellish my stuff. Yeah, sure. 
I remember there was an old uh, Kevin Nash interview, obviously being very sarcastic, and he's like, man, when I beat Backlund for the title, there was 20,000. And they're like, wait a second, in 94, 20,000 people? He goes, yeah, yeah, counting the ushers and everything. Oh, yeah, he goes, and they're standing room only. Like, <laughs> right, right. He would just make the, more people. He's like, I think it was 25,000. Like, he was just making more and more people. Right. Yeah, and, and, and Kevin's good, a good smart ass, so he knew yeah. where it was coming from. Uh, mean, more CG best. Hello, people. WrestleMania 40 coming, X a.k.a. WrestleMania XL. Oh, XL means 40. No, yes. no, I understand. Yes. Okay, sure. Yes, WrestleMania 40 is coming. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching. Two-night extravaganza. Well, three nights if you're going to watch the Hall of Fame. Yeah, and we're all the next nights in Philly, too. Yeah, so four nights. Four nights in a row. It's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. They got so much stuff. They they just uh, they take over the town when they're there. I, re I remember the days when WrestleMania was one day, one night. But it was an all-night affair. So now, how many matches are there on this show? So far, I read that there's ten so far. So it would be five and five, probably. But they've wow. they've got a lot to add. Like Mysterio needs a match. Lashley needs a match. So they've got matches to add, for sure. So there might be at least 12. I would think. Yeah. Man. It kind of, I would do seven and seven, like seven matches and seven matches the next. But I don't know with Triple H, he tends to do less matches in the card, but really long matches. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Modern day cowboy Mitch Miller. I remember when The Rock gave Harvey Whippleman a car for helping him out in the past. Has The Rock ever reached out to Doctor Tom and said thanks? Uh, no. Ouch. That would be a no. Come on, that's, Rock. That, that's okay. Come on, what's your problem, Brock? Come on. Well, I think Harvey let him live uh, live with him. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't live with him in Stanford. But when you saw him and stuff, you guys were buddies. I mean, you were. Oh, you sure. Were, yeah. Certainly. Just, just you would have to see him and stuff. We just, we just haven't uh, connected in that way. And, you know, Rock knew Harvey when he was a, a you know, teenager. So he was living with him then. And, uh, you know, they, it just is, it's a different relationship. And Harvey gave Rock a car before he could even drive. He was letting Rock drive around in the car. Right. Yeah. Pretty good of Rock to give back like that. Pretty amazing. Well, it's good. It's very amazing. It's very cool. Scorch. I watched both Buff Bagwell and Terry Gordy episodes of Dark Side of the Ring. Truthfully, I felt worse for Terry Gordy because of how talented he was before that flight to Japan. Well, I we were just talking, and I got home last night uh, about five minutes to ten, and I got to watch. Uh, I wanted to watch the Terry Gordy episode, and I did watch it. And uh, that's the first time I've seen Terry when he was 14 years old in the ring, you know, with the blonde hair. And my God, he was a big kid. But he started working at 14 years old. By the time he was 18, he was a free bird and working with Michael Hayes. And they they were, uh, what a team they were, man. I worked with them my second, no, my third match ever in Louisiana. Uh, took the power bomb from Terry. So, you know, he, he just, he was an incredible talent. And uh, I felt kind of bad for Terry too, especially after seeing him, seeing the interview last night. I never seen the uh, RF video uh, interview he did, but that was that was a, an example and a case of what it was in the uh, '80s and '90s. Very, very sad to see because man, he was talented. Oof. Yeah, he, he was. was. Awesome. One of the best big men around. Yeah, one of the best period. Yeah, and he was so over in Japan at one point. I mean, he God, he might have been almost as over, like as you say, Gaijin's, like more so than Hanson at one point, which is crazy to think. Well, yeah, he and Doc had their tag team, and uh, yeah, so they they were over big time. Craig Seabag has a great question for you. Years ago in Vancouver, Greg the Hammer Valentine refused to go to the ring until the promoter gave him $500. Have you ever been in a locker room where this has happened? Let me see. I mean, where somebody's held up uh, the promoter? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I have. I don't want to really? mention any names. Yeah, uh, I don't want to mention any names, but uh, 
Yeah, I actually have. Basically, they said we're not I'm not going to the ring and, until we get paid. Well, he he was guaranteed. This is this is the story I heard. The guy was guaranteed his his payoff, but then he wanted I think uh, two hundred dollars more because they drew a hell of a house. But he already got the guaranteed paid off payoff. So uh, he was trying to hold him up for two hundred bucks more. He got it. Wow. Damn. Yeah. Damn. That almost happened to me once. Uh, Fred and autograph signing. I'm not doing it unless. And then I was like, "Come on!" And yeah, I don't, were, I don't know if they were busting my balls to see if I would do it, but I was like, "Nah, I can't do that. We didn't agree." But then they, they were cool. But yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah. No, no. This this guy's notorious for doing stuff like oh. that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I know. I remember one time at a signing, one of the biggest names of all time. Said to the guy, "Hey, I'm not sitting here for another hour because the line was going out the door. So you got to give me an extra five grand." And the guy gave him an extra five grand, and he signed every autograph after that. And he stayed over an hour, but still, he was yeah. giving a hard bargain. Yeah, it happened. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I mean, some guys can do that, and some guys can't. So, hey, the infamous story: SummerSlam 1991 match made in heaven, match made in hell. Ultimate Warrior did that to Vince. Before the main event, obviously him and Hogan are a tag match. Sid's the ref, and then the Triangle of Terror of Adnan, Sheik, and Slaughter on the other end. He says, Vince, I'm not going out there unless I get a $100,000 raise or whatever it was. I think it might have been more. So Vince says, yes, it, you have to go out there, the pay-per-view. Yes, he, he does it. Warrior does the match. He comes back in the curtain, not giving you the money. You're fired. You're fired. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. As soon as the match is over. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's the way to do it. Crazy, crazy, crazy. It is crazy. I believe Sting and Dr. Tom are close in age. Was this the right time for Sting to retire, and did he need to leave much sooner? Thank you. I don't know. Uh, Sting was in shape, and and I think he, he's in, he was enjoying himself. So, um, you know, and, and he could probably get away with doing less. But he, he wanted to go out there and have a hell of a retirement match. So, uh, yeah, for Sting to retire, it, it was probably, you know, about the right time to do it. If somebody's going to pay him that much money to come out and, and have a great retirement match, I have no problem with that. Just turn, as we're recording this today, turn 65 today. Well, I'll be 65 in August, so, yeah, we're the same age. Imagine if you were doing death matches and stuff and, and wrestling like that at 65. Nope, I ain't doing it. Don't want to do it. Sting yeah. is crazy. Yeah, but, and, he, but, he, but he got paid well for it. So. Oh, yeah. But it's funny. They used to say, oh, he, the guy doesn't love the business and stuff like that. He wrestled for 40 years. <laughs> what do you mean he didn't love yeah. the business? Yeah, I think he does. I think he does. I think he did a pretty good job. He's just not one of those guys. It's like a work rate guy. So for some reason, if you're not like you know one of those like work rate guys, like oh, he doesn't love the business. Yeah, that has nothing to do with it. I really don't yeah. think that has anything to do with it. You know, he he knew what he could do and uh, knew what he could do well. Lashley will be involved in a hurt profits versus final testament match for sure at WrestleMania 40. That's from the Ragu Overlord. That's possible, definitely. They've been building towards that. Who is the final testament? That is Carrion Cross and the Authors of Pain, oh. managed by Paul Ellering. Okay, that makes sense. Remember that guy, Paul Ellering? Yeah, I heard of him. Man managed that famous tag team, the Road Warriors? Yes. Does Dr. Tom know why Michael P.S. Hayes was absent in the Terry Gordy episode of Dark Side of the Ring? I don't know for sure, but my guess is that Michael probably didn't want anything to do with it because it would be a negative... Uh, uh, take no matter what happens i mean um i didn't i didn't see it as negative but there was a lot of uh uncomfortable uh information in there that that maybe michael didn't want to be a part of and and talk about it because michael would have to talk about it and uh otherwise there'd be no point in having him on but i can right. that, that that's what i would surmise is michael just didn't want to go out and talk about the the negative stuff didn't he say he didn't want to do dark side of the ring or something didn't he come out not that long Probably. ago i, I could have sworn he said he wasn't going to do it anymore yeah or wasn't going to do it yeah yeah i could I, I can i can see michael saying that 
Was the office during the Attitude Era ever high on Buff Bagwell? Like, did, you, did the office and the behind the scenes like Buff? I don't think so. I, I mean, I just think, again, Buff had a high opinion of himself, much higher than a lot of other people did. And uh, I, I don't think the office saw it that way. That's just, uh, I don't know for sure because no one ever came over to me and said that, but that's just my opinion. Could see Jr. saying, "Oh, this guy's got charisma. We could do something with him." But then, when you know, when he, he sees maybe a bad attitude, then maybe that that kind of changes. Like, all right, maybe we can't do something with him. Yeah, you gotta. I mean, attitude is everything. You just like uh, you're not gonna go anywhere. You, you, the difference between a flat tire and a bad attitude is you're not gonna go anywhere till you change them. So, good point. Yeah, yeah. and it did did feel like Buff after that neck injury in '98. Did feel like a little bit of a different buff than we got before because he was super athletic before that. Not that he wasn't after, but he was even more athletic in, in like the early nineties. Right. Yeah. Well, that could that could spook you a little bit. And I can pretty understand cool. that. Yeah. Great question here. ATF Media. Is it possible that Bagwell got punched by Hands of Stone, Ronnie Garvin, and got his neck broke before the match, but tried to make it look like it happened in the ring for workman's compensation? That actually did happen. I was there and I saw it. I saw the hands of stone running over and punch uh, Bagwell and uh, hurt his neck before he went out. I actually saw that. It happened in the uh, back of the Cleveland Stadium. Yeah. Crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, it was insane. $500,000 for the Warrior, according to Sergeant Slaughter, for, Summer, for SummerSlam 91. Too bad oh, wow. he didn't get that money, but man, that's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. Uh, what made Buff never reach the main event status? One thing in particular, or was it many things that Buff didn't reach? Well, again, I don't know for sure because I wasn't around uh, Buff all that much when he was when he was working. But you know, you got to know what you can and can't do. And um, while Buff looked great and, and knew how to work. Uh, again, that overinflated ego uh, doesn't do you any favors if if you're not over with the office. So, I think it was many things. I think it was a lot of things that kind of kept uh, Buff out of the main event picture. But I don't, I can't, I can't speak with uh, in a factual way because I don't know. Meet George Jetson right here. George Jetson has. The honky tonk man, or was the honky tonk man the one that you were talking about before? That was the person that basically held up the promoter for me. Oh honky- no, 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 no! This this guy part of a tag team. Oh, okay. I think I know who it was. I'm not even going to say because I believe this guy did that to me. He is a legend, by the way. Maybe not as good as the tag team partner, but he's he he is good. But if if it is who I think it is, um, looking back. Dr. Tom, you would have been a great Freebird. Did they ever approach you about it? That would have been awesome. Wow, Freebird. Wow, no, no. Uh, they approached Brad Armstrong about being Bass Street, though, and the, he was he was uh, you know part of the Freebirds for a while. But no, I, I, I hung with the Freebirds for a couple couple days, and it was uh, I spent a week with them one night. <laughs> you know, and if you can imagine, yeah. Michael, at that at that stage of the game, we went in. We went into a place. Uh, it was a bar slash restaurant, and uh, we sat at a table, and it was one of those hanging lamps. And Michael couldn't help himself; he head butted the lamp. And uh, as soon as he did that, the uh, manager came over and asked us to leave. Jesus. So yeah, yeah. Crazy free birds. The, free, the free birds were were not a gimmick. It was that was who they were, man. They lived it 24 7. I could see you as Buddy Jack Roberts. I could see that. I I, I have some Buddy Jack in me. (laughs) Uh, The only reason I would say is the reason you were in a free bird is because you always said that they were so overrated. So that would probably be a reason why you don't want, or they didn't want you in the group. Sure, that could be it. That's true. You actually said that? Oh, my God. No, I I never said that. You said that. Michael Hayes. We're get, you're literally going to get a call from Michael Hayes again. Remember when you said he wasn't a top five tag team and he freaked yes, I out? Did. Yep. Yes, I did. Yep. He's going to be pissed. That's okay. That, 
They are a top five, by the way. Just just my point of view. I know not yours, but my point of view. Mm-hmm. Matthew Hello. Holland, Johnny P, and Tom Pritchard. Hello, Matthew Holland. Is that Matthew on the right? I think so. Oh, okay. wait. Yeah. Yes. No, yes. Boogeyman. Oh, whoops. Yes, Boogeyman. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Phil, good evening. John and Dr. Tom just got here. Hello. Well, you haven't missed much, Phil. Roll me one Kenobi. Oh, that, I like that. Roll me one Kenobi. Hi, all. Yes. The legendary Frank Nordquest. Speaking of WCW wrestlers who didn't adapt well to WB, Big Papa Pump Scott Steiner had nothing but contempt for Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. I can understand why they got rid of him. Do you agree <sighs> with that assessment? Well, I, I've heard what, some things that Scott has said about Triple H and, and Steph, but uh, you know they're they're inducting him in the Hall of Fame. So, but I can understand because if you have again, it's it's I've I've been guilty of having a bad attitude as well. So I understand. And if you have a bad attitude and don't know how to adapt and don't know how to uh, get along, then uh, what what good are you to them? So I can I can understand why they got rid of him too, if he had that kind of attitude. Totally understand. Well, well, there's a great story that he even says is true because he he said it on interviews and stuff that they wanted him to kept going for like steroid tests, steroid tests, and he said, "Does Triple H do them?" And like, well, and he goes, "Well, how about this? Pick, Triple H picks me up in a limo tomorrow morning. We go take the test together. Guess what? They both never got tested. They never got tested. How about that? <laughs> but he called their butt. He called their bluff. Like, I'll go with Triple H, and they're like, yeah. nope, yeah, yeah, yeah. And apparently. It. Apparently, he told Michaels he's going to kick his ass. Apparently, he told Flair he's going to kick his ass. So, yeah. So, those three guys were kind of scared of Scotty Steiner. Well, you know, well they probably should be. Yeah. It's a couple of things you can't do. You can't call the uh, the boss a flaming asshole, and you can't threaten to kick the top guy's ass, especially when you can. So. Now, I, I interviewed Scotty recently. He said, he's like, it's all water under the bridge. You know, everything is good because, you know, because of Braun. He, and he said he's definitely softened over the years. But, you know, back then he was, you know, he didn't like those guys. But now he said, all water under the bridge. <laughs> of course maybe, it is. Maybe not Flair, but Triple H and Michaels, he's okay with. Of course, of course it is. And, and all my stuff's water under the bridge, too. Yeah. Yeah. George Jetson, as highly regarded trainers, meaning you and Rip Rogers, do you have any good stories on Rip Rogers, and have you ever wrestled Rip? I have wrestled Rip, and Rip's a hell of a worker. Um, but Rip, uh, yeah, Rip really, really impressed me as a trainer because he knows his stuff and he knows a lot of different things, uh, ways to get in in and out of holds and, and uh, different scenarios. So Rip's a smart guy. But I did wrestle Rip in uh, Continental in Pensacola. He's a good hand, if you will. Yes, he is. He trained some pretty good guys as well. Yes, he did. He trained McAfee, as a matter of fact. And polished, obviously, guys like Lesnar and Orton and all those other guys. Yes, Lesnar, Orton, Cena. Sure did. Does Cornette like Buff Bagwell? Did he mention him to you? No, Jimmy has never mentioned Buff Bagwell to me. I'm kind of surprised. I'm kind of surprised. Well, you know, we have better things to talk about, I guess. Dr. Tom and the Four Horsemen, I could see. Whoa, what do you think about that? I don't know about the Four Horsemen, man. They were uh, they were running pretty rough, uh, pretty rugged there for a while. So, I mean, that was Tully and Arn and Flair. Uh they, they really were a unit, you know, so they they rode uh, long and hard into the night every night. Very interesting, but, you know, they're asking about the Freebirds, they're asking about the Horsemen. You almost were a member of the Midnight Express, almost. Almost. That's right. It's, it's until they uh, bought Tampa and Stan was in Tampa doing nothing. So, uh and, and I think Stan was a perfect choice looking back because he, he had the look for that time period, and um, uh, he was great. He was great in the ring. Michael Hayes still living the gimmick, yes. Yes, he is. Definitely. Michael's always, always going to live the gimmick. 
Ibsen saying, I still remember when Vince on air fired Buff with the thumbs up, thumbs down segment with a live crowd on Raw. Not technically a firing, but he was basically kind of ripping some of the ghost guys. Remember, he goes, Lex Luger, thumbs up, thumbs down, like kind of ripping everybody. Yeah, those were the days. Those are the days when you can get by with that. Yeah, not not, not anymore. Uh, Jason, great question here. Do you think Brother Love should go in the Hall of Fame? He was pivotal in so many big storylines. Yes, I do. I do think Brother Love should go in the Hall of Fame. I think he will eventually. Did you ever spend time with the Mongolian Stomper? Gordy said that he liked to have a good time after the matches. I did spend some time with the Mongolian Stomper. What a nice man. He was, uh, you know, after knowing him, uh, without knowing him, watching his matches uh, as a kid, and then then getting to know him in, in uh, the continental area was was really something because he was uh, he was a top guy, and he was a sheriff's um, deputy in Tennessee for a while too. So nice man. Nice guy. Public nuisance. I thought Tom resembled Terry Gordy in the 1990s. Maybe in the hair, but man, he was big. Yeah, I was going to say you're probably about five inches shorter, though. Four. No, four. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Scott Steiner had no filter, which I loved. Totally, totally agree. That yeah. Was the best part. Yeah, Scott never had a filter. Yeah, and I wouldn't see too many guys wanting to mess with him either. I don't think so. I mean, I know Paige and him had some problems, uh, but but they probably settled that too. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Chief Bank, who was your best student? Well, there's been a couple of them, but I guess Rock has to be the best. Not Silas Mason. Wow. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to message him right now. Damn. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Uh, Kurt Angle is another one, pretty damn Kurt good. Angle, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kurt. You had Edge and Christian. You had uh, a lot of guys. I'm trying to the, think of the, the Brackus. Years. Rock. Uh, the Brackus. Yeah, Brackus. There we go. You're the on Bella. your game tonight. You are on your game tonight. The Bellas. There you go. Don't you really uh, you, you have those names in front of you, don't you? No, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Uh, of course Mark you are. Henry. Mark Henry, another one. Of course. Not a bad, Every, not a bad uh, list. I, you know, it's like asking who your favorite uh, child is, your favorite uh, kid. You know, you can't really pick just one. TWO, Tom's World Order. Mitch says he would be a member. That's not bad, TWO. TWO, I like it. I'm going to use that. Dell, I think that Norman Smiley would have been entertaining character in WB if they decided to acquire him from a WCW. Well, they did acquire Norman. He's a trainer at the PC now. So, yeah, I think Norman is very, very entertaining. Did you like the uh, screaming Norman gimmick that he would do? Yeah, I, I did because I, I I thought he was entertaining with it. And, and once I got to know Norman, what a nice guy. And for him to do that, um, you know, took talent and, and understanding what they were trying to get across. So, yeah, I think he did a great job doing that. Screaming Norman, remember the big wiggle? Remember that dance that he would do? That was great dance. He did that dance in FCW, too. <laughs> yes. Nice. Big wiggle. Nice. The black magic, Norman Smiley. He knows how to get over. Yes, he does. Uh, Goldberg did very well in WWE. He made the transition very well. Interesting. Well, they were going to make Goldberg uh, a star no matter what. He just he had that star quality, and he was a star in WCW, and it would, would have been crazy not to capitalize on that in WWE too. So, yeah, Goldberg did very well. Demolition should go into the Hall of Fame. I agree. I was talking to somebody today, and it was interesting. We always talk about that one lawsuit, the concussion lawsuit. But remember Bill Eady sued Vince before that, years before, because of low pay, because of the demolition name, which technically, I guess, Eady owned. It was a, it was a, another lawsuit, and I think that plus the concussion was like, you're never getting in. Like I think, feel like Vince totally was like against him after that. Well, it could be, but, I mean, Hunter is now uh... – 
in charge and i guess rock is the final boss yeah so you know there, there's a lot of things that could change with that you know you never know i mean some of the people who were on the outs could be on the end barbara's saying she'd rank ivy nile as one of your best students she's doing very well so far i think she's doing great yeah she is doing good ibsen says kurgan he's one of them Val Venus, does he count technically? He counts. Okay. Sure. Does Dr. Tom train wrestlers the way Iron Sheiky Baby trained him? No. Do not. Why not? Uh, because I, I think that it's a new day. It's 2024. And uh, I think I would rather see if you can work, see if you can grasp, instead of trying to discourage you. The way Sheik was doing it, it's the old school way. You try to discourage somebody from getting in the business. You want to see how tough they are, see if they yep. can take this stuff. I, I don't think that uh, that's the way to do it. You know, it's hard enough as it is to try and learn it right instead of just trying to go out there and show how tough you are. So I, I think as long as uh, you have the ability to adapt and learn and listen, that's, that's what really counts. I mean... You have to have uh, charisma. You have to have personality. And it uh, doesn't matter if you're a great amateur wrestler these days. It, it's it's always been about uh, in between the moves and, and what you do when you come to the ring and, and while you're in the ring. But uh, the Iron Sheik just wanted to stretch you and uh, prove how tough he was. Shaky baby. Whatever happened to David Flair? Ooh. I don't know. Do you? He what went, from what I was told, he absolutely hates the business. He wants nothing to do with it because obviously uh, Conrad, who's married to David's sister, would have the in with him to do stuff and he couldn't even get him to do anything. Wouldn't do a signing. Would do, apparently hates the business. Wow. Well, you know, maybe maybe I can understand that. You know, with, with Rick being on the road and not really uh, being there for him as a dad, I can understand that. Man, I feel like people would love to meet him. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like uh, it would be more positive than he, than he thinks. Yeah, but we don't know what he's. We don't know what David's been through. I mean, I I knew him when he was when he first came to WWE and did the deal with the Undertaker. And things like that. Nice guy, but uh, you know, it's it's not for everybody. It's a, it's a brutal, brutal business, cold business. So I can see that. Ragu is saying, I think David Flyer got married to the daughter of a wealthy family. He would be a great guest for the channel. Yeah, I would love to get David Flair if he would do anything, but he hasn't done anything. It's crazy. He's done. Done nothing, and I feel like if he doesn't do something for Conrad, I don't think he'll do it for anybody. Yeah, is that a family chief cook or chef cook? Oh, he's uh, talking about the guy chief uh, chief cook. Okay. So it's of a wealthy family, comma chief cook. That was the guy he was responding to. Ah, uh, okay, gotcha. Who's asking? Chief cook is asking. Should Baby Doll be in the WB Hall of Fame? I think so. I think she did. Uh, she was part of that WCW hot time. So, yeah, I, I, I would see her in the Hall of Fame. Tom, do you think WWE dropped the ball with Sean O'Hare? I Not necessarily. I, I knew Sean when he was in OVW, and uh, he was a different kind of guy. Um, and I think some of Sean's outside-the-ring escapades probably hurt him uh, in WWE. But – he was talented, big guy, had all the tools, just didn't know how to use them properly, I guess. Forget the story exactly, but um, Evan Marriott, a.k.a. Joe Millionaire, was telling me the story because he knew O'Hare when he was younger. Basically, he was in like military school, and one of the sergeants like pissed him off, and he's one of the kids, and he just beat the shit out of the sergeant. Like He, right. he, he does not care. Like, he's just like... He would snap, no thought, no judgment. Boom, beat the hell out of somebody, and just move on. Like yeah. you can't, can't beat you like that and just fly off the handle like that. No, you can't. So I think that's that's kind of what uh, 
uh, lost they where WWE lost confidence in him because you can't you, you got to be able to trust somebody to go in the ring and be professional. So I, I think that had a lot to do with Sean's problem. Ragu was saying David Flair's best stuff was with Russo when he went to Ric Flair's house. Yeah, remember he was doing that gimmick where he was like nuts and he's beating up the mailman and stuff. He was a good personality. He just wasn't good in the ring. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's tough to adapt sometimes. And and David had uh, some big uh, shoes to fill no matter huge. what. Yeah, huge. So, I mean, no matter what, he would always be compared to his dad. Pretty unfair. I mean, obviously, it's yeah, it's very unfair. Yeah. Guess what? Life's not fair. True, true. Public nuisance. Any thoughts on Paul Aroma? He seems to have a high opinion of himself, but also comes across as a straight shooter. I don't know Aroma, but uh, yeah, maybe you know you have to have a high opinion of yourself to to be successful, no doubt. But an overinflated opinion is is, is another thing altogether. So uh, I really don't know Paul. He, to me, was a, a great worker, a great hand. I yeah. loved his look. I thought he was believable. Apparently a bit of a tough guy in, in real life as well. But I, I just felt like Young Stallions, okay, that's kind of like the enhancement guy tag team of that era because there were so many good tag teams. But when he broke out with Power and Glory, I was like, oh, man, they should do more with them. He's great. Horseman, eh, that wasn't well. But then when he was with Orndorff, it's pretty wonderful. It's like, okay, that, that's like the perfect gimmick for him. Like that, that He showed how good he was. Yeah, I thought I – thought... Power and Glory was good, and uh, you're right. The Young Stallions was that that slot for that yep. tag team. I get it, and but but Roma had all the the tools and the looks too. Uh, I don't thought I, I don't think he fit the the Horseman uh, for whatever reason. You know, it's like uh, you had Arn and Tully. Arn was from Georgia. Tully's from Texas. Flair, Minnesota. Not a party guy either. He's not a drinker and a party guy either. Right. So you had to be, if you're going to be in the horse and you had to, uh, if you're going to be in that unit, you had to do what they did in order to make it work, in my opinion. But I don't, I don't know enough about Paul to, to comment on uh, his antics. Did Billy Robinson stretch the Iron Sheik? Heard he couldn't be trusted either and try to injure people. Billy Robinson. <laughs> I've never heard that, but it's possible. And Billy Robinson, I heard that, you know, is one of those guys that, uh, yeah, would try to hurt people just, just for the fun of it. He obviously had gotten a bit of a scuffle with High Chief Peter Maivia and might have come out on the wrong end of it. Yeah, so he got that googly eye. Yeah, his finger in the eye. Apparently, though, if you are fighting Haku or you know, High Chief Peter Maivia in a street fight, you're going to be in a lot of trouble because they're going for your eyes and everything else. So uh, like a shoot fight, quote unquote, and a street fight, two different things. I mean, yes. different world. Yeah. Yeah. And those two guys are badasses. Oh, big time. Big time. Uh, the Cuban assassin should be in the Hall of Fame. He was one of the most popular wrestlers in Canada for decades. Okay. And then uh, Roll Me One Kenobi says Dr. Tom for the Hall of Fame. Well, thank you, Roll Me One. Um, Barbara, hope Dr. Tom and the Midnight Express make the Hall of Fame. Very deserving. Well, I'll tell you, the Midnight really deserved to be in there. So does Cornette. And uh, maybe now that Kevin Dunn is out and uh, new people are in, that could probably happen. Wanted to mention this, too, and it's going to be on Peacock. I believe it starts April 1st. Bray Wyatt, Becoming Immortal, a new documentary, a part of uh, Peacock. So that should be good. Very interested in that. And I've noticed Peacock does a really good job. WB in general does an awesome job of documentaries. But I noticed Peacock really has been nailing them out of the park. The Flyer one, the Kurt Angle one, the Cody Rhodes one. So I feel like they've been doing a really good job with, with their documentaries. But the Bray Wyatt one looks pretty good. That's the trailer that came out. It looks very interesting gonna be sad obviously but good well yeah yeah but i'd, I'd like to see that too that, that sounds like it would be good now let's hit the plug dr tom let's talk about your book where can everybody get the, the book and maybe even as barbara would put it so eloquently an autograph copy well you can get the book if you uh, go to jp wrestling academy.com click on the training tab at the top and uh, the book will come up 
you can order the book right there and you can uh, email me at jp wrestling academy at gmail.com and ask for an autographed copy and i'll tell you how to do that follow me on twitter and instagram at two man power trip follow dr tom at dr tom pritchard jason saying thank you to us you never fail to entertain and inform thank you jason appreciate that the modern day cowboy mitch miller who has that awesome cowboy hat says always a great show anything Is that else bob orton? say what is that bob orton uh yeah i think it is actually yeah it's bob orton okay yeah. cool dave cole says by the way Cornette should clearly be in the hall of fame certainly i agree 100 percent. anything else going on in this crazy world that you you got coming up we're just getting ready for graduation at jpwa and uh can't wait thank you to a roll me one thank you to phil thank you to barbara of course Thank you, everybody out there for listening. See you right back here next week for a little Taking to School with Dr. Tom Pritchard. We'll see you next week, folks.